Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to Northeast Iowa. And George Wythe State Park near Waterloo on Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on this episode of Iowa Outdoors, we follow two Iowans who have embraced the trend of running barefoot. We travel to Jasper County, where astronomers hold dark sky at a premium. Explore a recreation area where mountain bikers are getting an adrenaline rush on miles of new trails. And row out onto Brushy Creek Lake to take in a unique view of a full moon. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. Heat and humidity, the trademarks of an Iowa summer, give way to cooler fall temperatures, and Iowans start looking for new types of outdoor adventures. Whether it's staring up at the stars, biking down a hill, or paddling out into one of our state's beautiful lakes, recreational areas like George Wythe State Park here in Iowa's Cedar Valley tend to see heavy traffic this time of year. Few obstacles keep us from tackling a trip into the Iowa wilderness. Not heavy rains or blazing heat or pitch black nights brought on by early sunsets. Some Iowans push past these extremes as well, partaking in the outdoor rewards while barefoot. When thinking about being barefoot outdoors, you probably conjure up memories of walking across the lawn or lying on a beach. But for a select group of Iowa athletes, being barefoot outdoors means one thing, running. Over the past couple years, barefoot running has built a fervent following. Some use it as a means of rehabilitation, others use it as a way to commune with nature. However, all see it as a chance to break free and simply run. What is the last thing you put on before stepping outside? For almost every activity you can think of, there is a specific set of footwear. For running, it's the sneaker. These shoes are crafted specifically to protect the foot, cushion the blow as we strike the earth, and provide a boost of endurance so we can run farther and faster. Shoe technology has just taken off. I mean, it's, it's to the point now that your foot can absorb way more than it's meant to. Adam Reese is a biomechanics expert, meaning he's been educated in the proper function of our joints, and in this case, that means the human foot. You know, if you're going for a 20-mile test run, you can pull it off. With, with shoes on, even if you're not in really that awesome of shape, just because your body can withstand it because the shoe technology is so amazing. That's a lot of stress that the body has to absorb. So they're gonna adapt to that in some way. It's gonna start building stiffness in the calf, hamstring, lower back, uh, and eventually you could develop an injury, but either way, it's just not altogether healthy to be running that far on a regular basis. Knowing full well that some people can't stop themselves from running too much or too far, a self-limiting alternative might be the answer, such as running barefoot. While it might sound odd at first, running barefoot, without a shoe to protect it, the foot is forced to stay within its limits. Your foot is gonna hit the ground perfectly every single time or it's gonna result in pain. But the biggest thing around barefoot running is that it's not about running more, it's about running better. It's about quality versus quantity. And uh, I think for people that are really long distance runners, that have been long distance runners their whole life and then they switch to barefoot, I think that that's what they're noticing. You know, you feel the coolness of the pavement, you feel the sunshine, you feel the cool. It's beautiful out, isn't it? Steve Schroeder has been running on and off his entire life. And after attempting to get up to marathon distance, 
he started to feel sharp pains in his knees. The pain eventually got so bad, Steve visited an orthopedic surgeon who gave him the worst diagnosis a runner can receive. I was told there was no cartilage left. And he just said, he goes, you just don't have knees. And you just, there's nothing left there. You're not going to run, you know, to any distance uh, without pain. And in my brain, it always said it was something isn't right. Steve says he tried every footwear and running trend he could find, but nothing relieved the pain he felt in his knees while running. That is until he discovered the minimal movement, where runners wear extremely thin-soled shoes, allowing them to feel the earth and potentially rehabilitate their legs. So it was kind of funny, about four, four and a half years ago, I went to a shoe store, and I remember talking to one of the salespeople there about, you know, well, give me some information on, you know, I'm thinking of, like, going minimal or even going barefoot. He goes, well, he goes, yeah, that, that's kind of neat. He goes, what you need to do is from where you're at today, he goes, there's like a series of three or four steps and you want to reduce yourself down in this series of programs. You have to condition your body and your foot because you can't just take your shoes off. He goes, you, you can't do that. And I remember looking at him and saying, well, why? So Steve did just that. He took his shoes off and for months simply walked around barefoot on different surfaces, just getting used to the feeling. Six months into his barefoot experiment, Steve got the courage to visit George Wythe State Park and finally go for a run. And I, I went out, it had been the first time I've kind of found a little dirt trail and, and it was kind of soft and I, I probably went like a quarter of a mile, kind of just a little jog and it felt so right. Steve was back. The pain was gone, and gradually, he built back up to marathon distances, running on virtually every surface imaginable. And this is where Steve and Adam's opinions on barefoot running differ greatly. The win nots of barefoot running would be if, like running on concrete. You would never do barefoot running on concrete. The easiest thing to run on barefoot is concrete. You're, you're going to pay attention to where you're at. You're going to look at the surface in front of you and up ahead. Uh, running on grass and dirt, sand, those things are good. They stimulate the feet. They're, they're soft. They allow for that, that gait that happens that, properly with barefoot running. These contrasting views come from how both approach barefoot. Adam, a biomechanic who builds workout plans for a living, sees barefoot running as part of an overall fitness and health program whereas Steve uses barefoot running as a way to be outdoors and experience nature. When you run barefoot, you run so quiet. You are so perfectly aligned to nature. You're perfectly aligned to your surroundings because you're part of it. I just think shoes, headphones, all this gear, we've lost track of what is the most basic human element, which is movement. If barefoot running is appropriate for you, then it's a portion of a comprehensive plan. You have tons of different muscles besides the muscles in your feet and the muscles in your legs, and I just don't think it's enough, and it's just not appropriate for enough people to make a blanket statement like that. I, I went barefoot primarily because it felt better. It felt natural, it felt real to me, but it's bigger than that. It's you feel things, you see things, and we don't need much more. Both Steve and Adam agree. There is the potential for most people to run barefoot, but it takes patience, awareness, and diligence. I think your body will become adjusted to where you're at, and you can adjust your body to anything as long as you allow it the time to do it. Not everybody should just go out and just barefoot run right away, but it definitely has its merits. You're just not gonna be able to run as far barefoot, so your body is gonna have that time to recover. Then, uh, things are probably gonna feel more regenerative and your tissues are gonna feel better, your foot is gonna feel better, everything's gonna kind of improve. You don't need a class, you don't need a teacher, you don't need a seminar. You do not need a strategy of 15 effective methods to do this. Take your shoes off, start walking around again, take the time to readjust to it. In mid-August, stargazers across the Northern Hemisphere are treated to the annual Perced meteor shower. 
depending on your location. Astronomers and amateurs alike are within telescopic distance of up to 50 shooting stars per hour. Surprisingly, finding an area of Iowa that's dark enough to enjoy the night sky is becoming increasingly difficult. Luckily, just north of Polk County near Mingo, Ashton Observatory has found a patch of dark sky offering visitors a clear view of our solar system. Astronomical time is generally measured by the millennium and its distance by light year. However, in less than two months, the late summer and early fall of 2015 has seen an exciting amount of celestial activity with September's rare total lunar eclipse and August's annual Persid meteor shower. In central Iowa, the Ashton Observatory has provided the perfect venue to enjoy everything that passes through the night sky. We've got two big telescopes um, in the observatory behind us, 16-inch scopes um, that are open every Saturday night from spring to fall for people to um, be able to look through. Virtually equidistant from Des Moines, Ames, Marshalltown, and Newton, the Ashton Observatory attracts stargazers from all around. Maintained in cooperation between Jasper County and the Des Moines Astronomical Society, the observatory is more than a great place to stare into the heavens. The Astronomical Society provides educational outreach to the public. Um, we've got members all the way from, like me, that's kind of a new member, very amateur, to some folks that have been here for years, have studied a lot about astronomy, taught astronomy at college level. If this is your first time ever being here, um, if you could raise your hand up, we have a gift. In the 30 years since the observatory opened, members such as Bruce have been imparting their astronomical wisdom to sky-watching newcomers, and September's total lunar eclipse was the perfect example. The moon will move completely into the dark part of the Earth's shadow, and, and you'll see the moon change from its, its normal bright white color to a probably a, a deep red color. It's going to be a really interesting show. While the lunar eclipse enraptured uninitiated astronomers across the planet, attendees of Bruce's Ashton Observatory eclipse class were exceptionally informed. And, and we talk about bright, brightness as albedo. Bruce covered the eclipse from every conceivable angle, including history, stages, timing, and much more. And since the lecture was luckily a day prior to the eclipse, visitors were given the perfect opportunity to test run their newfound knowledge with Astronomical Society members waiting outside. Oh wow, yeah, no, that's, that's really great. Keith Herod is a common participant in the observatory's Saturday sessions. At 63, Keith guesses he has 50 years of stargazing fandom behind him, and he loves sharing his passion, not to mention his telescope, with others. This particular telescope on a clear night should, uh, I should be able to see things down to about 16th magnitude. The human eye runs out at about magnitude six. Let me put it this way. The 12 inch mirror in here is equivalent to 2,962 of my pupils. On the night of the eclipse, Astronomy devotees like Keith were more than willing to offer their instruments to eager stargazers. And for those who drove out to the observatory, the eclipse gathering will not soon be forgotten. Sadly, if you miss the total lunar eclipse, your next chance won't arrive until 2033. Thankfully, you don't have to wait that long to enjoy the Ashton Observatory, as its Saturday sessions continue through the fall. Fall is a great time to get out and explore the scenic Iowa countryside on two wheels. And although most cyclists ride traditional road bikes on paved surfaces, there's a growing number of off-road mountain bikers in Iowa. This summer, White Rock Conservancy near Coon Rapids opened a new 13-mile single-track mountain biking trail, creating a new destination for mountain bikers to find adventure. Go. 
Some of the newest mountain biking trails in Iowa wind back and forth through the historic oak savannas and prairie grasses and wildflowers, and zip up and down the hilly terrain carved by glaciers thousands of years ago between the Driftless Plain and the Prairie Pothole region. These trails give cyclists a better opportunity to explore the 5,500-acre land trust outside Coon Rapids, gifted to White Rock Conservancy by the well-known Garst family. Our mission is to not only protect and preserve this land and restore it to its uh, historic, you know, wild vitality, but also to farm it sustainably as commercial farmers and to demonstrate sustainable agriculture for other farmers in Iowa. And, uh, and then the, the last piece, which is uh, very important, is, is our goal is to open up this landscape to the public. And we've been working on this for years because it's a big piece of land and it's hard to open up access to this wild land but uh, the building of our trails this year was a, a really important part of that. Every weekend since it's been open, I've been here. <laughs> and why is that? Just because I'm having a blast. You know, you can ride for three hours here and uh, just hit the trails once, maybe, maybe twice. There's a lot here. The interesting topography at White Rock lends itself very well to mountain biking trails. Several scientists evaluated the land and helped determine where the trail should and shouldn't go to show off the landscape while also preserving and protecting the land. Most of our mileage is up on the hillsides and so there's a lot of rocking, a lot of undulating, a lot of banking uh, left and right. So it's kind of like a, a roller coaster in the woods. And um, I mean, I really just started mountain biking when we started building trails here and I'm, I'm hooked. It's just so much fun. My first time on a mountain bike for in Iowa at all. It was quite an experience. I'm usually a road biker. That's beautiful. It's so much different than regular road climbing. A lot dirtier too. <laughs> there are 13 miles of single track mountain biking and hiking trails at White Rock, six miles of equestrian and hiking trails, and almost 20 miles of double track trails for any kind of use, including low power all-terrain vehicles. Three more miles of mountain biking trails are planned to be added in 2016. This is a destination trail system. You know, you, can, you, you drive out here and you can bike the whole weekend if you want. And then maybe float the river one afternoon, you know. So it's a destination, unlike a lot of other trails um, in the state. Uh, there's a lot here, and it's not just biking. White Rock Conservancy is the third largest recreation area in Iowa. It's open to everyone like a public park, but it's different because it's a nonprofit. Whether or not we're successful long term as a nonprofit providing these services is whether or not enough people feel that they're valuable to actually support us as a nonprofit. And that's the big question. White Rock asks trail users to pay a small fee to help defray the cost of maintaining the trails. They also rent mountain bikes and helmets if you want to give it a try and don't have your own. The White Rock staff wants to try grooming the trails this winter so bikers can ride year round. Great activity. It's fun, it's adventuresome. Uh, you, you get your adrenaline rush while you're, built, while you're burning calories. So what's not to like? Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, I can go out hiking or do a little jogging and the next day I'll have pains and I'll be sore, but on a bike, I'm not sore the next day. I'm tired the next day, but I'm not sore. This type of trail is designed to be both environmentally and economically sustainable. They're not very expensive to build and they're easy to maintain. But even though it may look like a simple, worn dirt path, there's science and innovation behind the trail design. These trails are bench cut into the sides of slopes. Uh, bench cut is just a little notch cut out of the side of the hill, about three feet wide, and with a little 5% uh, slope left, so the water will sheet off. And then um, also, uh, pretty frequently, there's something called a grade reversal, where the, where the trail purposefully dips. And then the trick is to build these slopes and these grade reversals in a way that it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to ride. So the grade reversal ends up being a dip followed by a rise. And then of course the, the trail's undulating along the slopes. So that's how you get the roller coaster effect. And I'm sort of a transplant from the West. I've lived in Utah and Nevada. So um, really was into mountain biking out there. So I was super excited to get out and try these trails. This is great single track out here. Um, really surprising to me uh, for Iowa, you know, that you can get some nice trails like this in some nice hilly terrain instead of just the typical flat rolling hills that you have as you're road biking through the cornfields or whatever. There are opportunities for all skill levels. 
Many trails at White Rock Conservancy are considered intermediate, mostly because of length. The hills were tough at first. Uh, some of the hills I would stop going up them just to catch my breath. Now I just climb right up them. Um, you catch on quick. Here you've got twists and turns and roots and rocks and everything that you kind of got to be looking out for. So, um, you know, a lot more ups and downs. You can get going a little faster on the downhills and it's a little more technical. So uh, I, I enjoy that challenge. It's much more technical riding than, than road bike. And you really got to be on your game all the time watching those, those ruts. And it's so much different than just sitting back and just pumping out miles. So I like all the variety that Iowa has for biking and this is really nice. Mountain biking tests your physical and mental toughness. And at a place like White Rock Conservancy, you can enjoy the sport while also discovering some of the history and beauty of the Iowa outdoors. Few things are as peaceful as paddling onto a quiet Iowa lake. But add a full moon to the mix, and you have a recipe for a very special experience. Several Iowa communities have begun embracing this activity by offering scenic tours of Iowa waterways under pitch black skies. Whether you're a novice or a veteran rower, everyone is invited to participate in the nocturnal paddle. At Brushy Creek State Park near Lehigh, the DNR has gone one step further, providing canoes and kayaks at no cost. And for the last full moon of the summer, the Brushy Creek Night Paddle had its largest participation to date. Just south of Fort Dodge sits Brushy Creek State Park a 6,000-acre equestrian park and campground. Once a forested canyon, Brushy Creek was flooded in the late 80s to create a recreation area and Brushy Creek Dam. While popular with fishermen, campers, and horseback riders, on full moon summer nights, the DNR invites paddlers out onto the lake to take in the night sky. People come out, they can use kayaks or the canoes, and then they go out on the water. We go around Taylor Island, which is the island right behind me. And it takes about a half hour to 45 minutes. For six years, Aaron Ford and the Webster County DNR have been organizing Brushy Creek night paddles. At no cost, attendees can drive up to the park's south boat ramp and find the DNR providing a limited supply of everything required to get out on the water. So if you're out here a little bit before we get started, you'll more than likely get a vessel, either a canoe or a kayak. And then, yeah, we have the paddles, we have the vests, we have the lights, we have all that stuff. So all they have to do is just be here. Even though the night paddle is a summer favorite for seasoned paddlers, it routinely draws first timers with high expectations for the evening. I'm hoping we see some stars. It's kind of cloudy tonight. Some nature, definitely. Some nature. <laughs> Each other, hopefully not fall in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we don't get lost from each other because this is a new adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Brushy Creek is well known with locals from Fort Dodge, Lehigh, Duncombe, and other nearby towns, with everyone having their own personal history with the park. I need that. <laughs> My grandfather actually grew up out here, and so I came out here as a child with him, and so this is, um, this is kind of home to me. The full moon is unquestionably the main attraction, but according to Night Paddle veterans, there's much more to experience than just the sky. I came to the one on July 31st, and it was a beautiful full moon. We went around the, the island behind us, and watched the sunset. We had a mink show up that night and kind of followed us around. It was just beautiful, something different. It was quiet like the lake is tonight and, and really enjoyable, very relaxing. Tina and Sue are a mother and daughter duo who bought their kayaks just before the summer, all the while eagerly waiting for the boating season to kick off. Hearing about their various kayak outings, it's easy to see how anyone could get hooked on the activity. 
Last week, we went on a, a short jaunt um, on Lizard Creek, which was our first time out other than a lake. And so just to, to be out in the trees and the water, and we had a blue heron that zigzagged the whole trip in front of us, and just... And a bald eagle over us. A bald eagle flying over us. So yeah, that was pretty cool. While kayaks generally sit only one person at a time, they're a great way to introduce others to the water and have a really unique adventure. We've had six of my grandkids in the kayaks this summer, and so we just use this as an opportunity to, to share with them and, and learn and teach, and, and it's something they can do. They can't drive a motorboat, they can't, but they can get in a kayak and go. So it gives them kind of power in their hands, which is kind of fun too. As the summer night paddle season came to a close, Brushy Creek and the Webster County DNR saw its largest crew of rowers show up for its last event. Thankfully, a day that started off as overcast and wet gave way just in time for the paddle, allowing the last full moon of the summer to peek out from behind trace clouds and give paddlers one last look at the night sky. That wraps up this early autumn edition of Iowa Outdoors. We encourage you to get outside and enjoy our state parks like George Wythe here in Waterloo. And if you're planning any autumn outdoors travel, check out our extensive video archives of adventures from across Iowa at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. Our fifth season of Iowa Outdoors will continue with monthly installments throughout 2015 with stories from every corner of our state. We'll leave you now with some more images of early autumn in Iowa. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users.